Uh, so, uh, today's talk is about importing uh, KVM instances from remote KVM hosts, whether those hosts are part of cloud stack installation, standalone installation, whatever, I'll cover the possibilities. And also we are going to explain uh, how we provision instances from an existing QCOW2 file, which was already placed on a primary storage pool, and also a little bit of more uh, chat that was not originally on the agenda because I have time. Uh, a couple of words about myself or three kind of personalities depending how I wake up. Uh, so I'm working as a cloud architect for ShareBlue uh, in the IT for the last 17 or so years and interestingly enough I realized this year or, or the previous year it was around basically 10, 10 plus years in uh, involvement with cloud stack as of for zero incubating version. Uh, in the meantime, somebody was foolish enough to uh, basically invite me to become a project committer and PMC member. I'm a father of two daughters and I'm uh, a petrol fan, not a fan, that's my personal preference, but I absolutely uh, understand that everybody has different preferences. So, uh, let's move forward. Uh, again, what I already mentioned and title already kind of says, uh, we are going to explain how to import, which is actually a migration or a copy of instances from remote KVM hosts, and how to import, which is actually creation of the instances from existing QCOW2 images on the primary storage. The last one is also one of the features in the 4.19.0. This is new stuff in 4.19.0, but we'll talk later on. So, <clears throat> uh, obviously as part of uh, improvements in 4.19 about, you know, when it comes to migrations from external systems into cloud stack, which was always kind of a pain point for people transitioning or migrating away from other platforms to cloud stack. One of the possibilities is uh, to basically connect via Libvirt to a remote KVM host. So the requirements are that the remote KVM host must be running Libvirt, which means Proxmox is not supported because it doesn't unfortunately uses Libvirt. Uh, we must allow TCP connection the, on the default port and the cloud stack will connect to list the instances. And we also, so we only support migrating instances in a stop state, obviously, uh, for very technical reasons. Um, and um, basically you need to enable SSH access on a default port, uh, which is later used by the SAP process. Uh, so how it actually works, so we have two APIs uh, for this whole migration process. The first API is list VMs for import, which connects to the libvirt on the default port 16509, lists the VMs, filters, and shows only the shutdown VMs. You'll see a demo, uh, three demos all, to, all together today and uh, it will offer, um, offer us a VM to migrate. Uh, and after the, all, basically what we do, we connect to the remote KVM host, we initiate the conversion of the original volumes to a, uh, let's say, uh, let's call it a final if you like, a QCOW2 image that's converted locally. Uh, you'll see in the demo, uh, basically there is option to specify whatever path on the remote KVM host where this temporary QCOW2 should be created. And then we, do SC, we use SCP to copy over to the cloud stack primary storage pool. Uh, and later, yeah, import VM uh, API is the one who actually creates the VM out of the existing uh, QCOW2 image. Right, uh, so let's, uh, let's do a very short demo, uh, which is of course video recorded, but personally narrated. Uh, so here we have a cloud stack UI, but first I'm going to show you that on the remote KVM host I can do the wish list all. There is a bunch of VMs, but there is only one VM in the uh, shut off or shut down or stopped state, if you like. Uh, so we basically expect that cloud stack will filter or show us only this VM. So we'll go to the tools, import, export instances uh, section, and as the source hypervisor, we are going to choose KVM. Uh, and then we have a couple of options. Uh, import instance from remote KVM host is the one we are interested in at the moment. We need to obviously specify the IP of the remote host, uh, username and password, which will later be using the SCP pro process. Uh, the temporary path is a path on the remote hypervisor where we will convert the original volume, whatever it is, QCOW or Ceph or something else, to a QCOW. Uh, by default, it's slash TMP, and let's fetch first instances. This is doing unauthenticated call to the libvirt. We, we, we are basically showing only a single CentOS 8 uh, instance, as you can see. 
And let's import the instance, a uh, couple of fields, display name, how you will see it in cloud stack. The host name is what will be, let's say, added to the virtual router for the DHCP name. Uh, and uh, you have the option to, to assign this VM or import this VM for a particular domain and an account or to a project, or if you leave it empty, it will be imported for yourself as the owner. We can choose compute uh, offering, obviously, the size of the VM and to which network we want to attach our our stuff. Uh, there is a force button here, which is slightly different named in different uh, situation, which ba basically will ensure that if this MAC address is already exists in CloudStack database, it will force regenerating a new one. Importing instances, now this is not an edited video, this is really uh, live, why it was so quick, quick it was 4 gigabyte empty image really, uh, not really operating system installed. But you can see that there is an instance and it's also in a stopped state, so the conversion of the QCAL and the copy of the QCAL was very quick. You can obviously start the instance and, um, you know, List its volumes. You can see it's for gig file. Uh, it's attached to whatever network we have chosen previously, um, and and uh, yeah, and so on. Uh, one thing um, they wanted to uh, mention, but I'll do that in the next demo. Probably is just a change of the operating system type uh, after the import in all in all these kind of imports. So the next one uh, is importing or actually more specifically creating instance from an existing QCAL2 file. So you as an operator, you do whatever magic you need to do, uh, and then you place simply copy or whatever your QCAL2 file on the primary storage. It, it only NFS is supported for the moment, uh, or local storage pools in, in KVM, on KVM hosts. Uh, so uh, when we create instance around this QCAL2, the QCAL2 is not moved anywhere. It is expected to be in the root of the storage pool. Uh, there are a couple of limitations or checks actually, not limitations, sorry, my, my bad. Uh, checks in place, so it has to be in the root of the storage pool, not in some subfolder. It cannot have a backing file, so it needs to be a full standalone image. It must be obviously QCAL2 format, not raw may not be encrypted, may not be used, or by another VM. So this is only doc documentation, but just given here for purposes. And we still use the same import VM API. Like in previous case, it handles different scenarios. The import VM API is used to create an instance using this existing QCAL2 file. Now again, let's do a short demo to actually see this in work instead of boring slides. I'm the one of those guys who don't put a lot of monkey pictures or other kind of animals. So I try to focus on demos. Right, so CloudStack, here we have again a dashboard over here. Uh, now first, before I go to the tool section and, and show you the UI, I'm actually going to a KVM host. I'm copying uh, on a remote KVM host, I'm copying a uh, CentOS QCAL2 to a mount point by my name, Andrea, which is actually mounted primary storage. So I'm first, as an operator, providing an external QCAL2 file on specific primary storage. Now, let's show primary storage pools in CloudStack. You can see we, at the moment, have two. Uh, I know that I've mounted the first one, so that's the one where I expect my QCAL, CentOS 8.QCAL to live. So now we're just going to grab, uh, basically, uh, mount points on a destination, uh, one of the KVM hosts, actually. Uh, by the name of the storage pool, I'm going to check, basically, the mount point. I'm just going to confirm, nothing else, I'm just confirming that my CentOS 8.QCAL2 is here. This is the one which I copied previously. So I've done the preparation I provided. Quick camo image info, you can see it's four gigs in size. In, in reality, it's an empty image, so that the demo goes very fast. Um, that being said, let's move uh, to CloudStack. Uh, we'll close the infrastructure menu, open the tools. Again, import, export instances. Uh, and this time, again, source hypervisor KVM, uh, but this time I'm going to choose uh, to import from local shared, in my case this is shared storage pool, so I'm, oops, sorry. I'm going to choose just a shared storage pool um, and choose the one where I prepare my Q, uh, QCAL2 at or on. Uh, I'm going to paste the name of CentOS 8.QCAL2, which is exactly the name you could see listed on the mount point, the file which I provided previously as an uh, external operator, let's say. And I'm going to hit import instance, similar wizard. We give the display name, uh, host name is optional, otherwise it's the same as the display name, domain and the project. You can assign this film to another 
a domain or an account or another project. Otherwise, it will be imported for yourself as the owner of this instance. Um, that being said, uh, compute offering, something we will choose again to which network to attach it. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, you can always use the force button to override and regenerate meta address if, if needed, but this is literally lifetime. Why? Because we just created database records. That's all. No interaction with external components. The QCOW is already there. You can see that my VM imported. Uh, what you want to notice here, during all these imports, we assigned the default uh, CentOS 4.5 32-bit operating system type because of the way the feature was implemented. That's something we could uh, work on uh, as impro to improve in, in some of the other releases. So you want to edit the VM instance just to change the operating system type to whatever is your particular operating system type. Doesn't actually influence much on KVM, but it's, it's recommended. Uh, start the instance, nothing special, and I'm just going to show you now, if I click on volumes, uh, you will see, uh, you will see basically the, the regular root dash something whatever ID, but if you click on the volume at the very bottom, you can see the path, it's not this cryptic UID based, it's actually the CentOS 8 QCOW 2, which I copied over to my primary storage. Previously, we had to create a template of the QCOW 2 file, upload it to a web server, download it, it was a hassle, now you can just do it like that. Uh, and we have similar feature in the next release of CloudStack, but I'll share this as part of the news for the next release. Uh, now, this is something I sneaked in, uh, basically, as a, I won't say too much of a surprise, but another extremely important feature for people transitioning, unfortunately now from VMware, which I could never imagine would be happening. Uh, there is option, obviously, obviously, in CloudStack to take a VM from VMware and migrate it or clone it into CloudStack on KVM only. Now, uh, the way this works, in the background we use Virtu.V, which is an industry standard tool, uh, for such conversions, uh, which actually modifies uh, the storage driver inside the guest OS, does all kind of modifications as needed, um, updates the NITRAM FS if needed. Uh, on Windows, for example, it will even uh, change the registry, Windows registry, to ensure that the virtual drivers, KVM virtual drivers, are loaded at the boot time, which you know is always a hassle. You need to attach a second disk, so it loads the driver, then detach it, and then only the first disk can be you know, all, all, the, all the kind of stuff. But basically, uh, the whole uh, conversion is done uh, without uh, human intervention, so to say. Nothing to change yourself inside the, inside the operating system. Now, the success conversion uh, depends purely on the Virtu.V success. Uh, if you use Ubuntu 22.04 or EL8 based operating system, it's using some older version 1.4 of the Virtu.V, which is decently old. But uh, that's why we recommend using EL9, even if you're running CloudStack with Ubuntu base, which a lot of people are doing these days because of, because of uncertainty of the EL clones. Uh, still, it's recommended to have at least one uh, dead cluster with at least at least a single EL9 host, which will do these conversions. Because on EL9, uh, the Virtu.V version is newer, much newer, 2.3.4, which ensures much greater success rate. If you install Ubuntu, it will be the least success rate of all the. I'm talking about the host operating system. However, the support also depends on the guest operating system. So you cannot migrate, for example, Windows 11, which technically requires TPM device. Uh, on VMware, there is option, if it's a standalone VMware, to have a virtual TPM device. Now, uh, there is no such support uh, yet in CloudStack, but we've added this as a, a feature on a roadmap, and hopefully it will get in at a certain point in time. So it's impossible to boot Windows 11 without TPM. That's the technical limitation of the Windows 11. So just for example, but most of your work workloads will be server-based. There is a number of simple requirements, which I'm not going to give here because this is just a quick overview. I'm going to show you a demo instead, but you can always find all the details on the official documentation uh, page of uh, CloudStack. Um, here I have a VM, which is i2-196. Uh, if you see my pointer, this one, uh, it's running whatever it is running, other Linux, doesn't matter really. And this is the VM I want to migrate from, away from VMware. Now I'm going to go into the tools section and again uh, going to the same uh, import export instances. Uh, 
submenu here as a source hypervisor I'm choosing VMware this time, and the option is to migrate existing instance to KVM. So that's what I'm going to choose. Now we support uh, connecting to, we need to connect to the vCenter, obviously, to list instances. You can either connect to an existing one, which means that this vCenter is something that's already added or managed by CloudStack, or you can go to external vCenter, you just need to specify basic IPs, username and data center and password and so on. No difference whatsoever. We just need to connect to the vCenter and authenticate successfully. Now in my zone here, I have actually uh, this specific part of the cloud, cloud stack, uh, sorry, vSphere is added to cloud stack. So I'm just going to choose my zone, drill down and basically find my vSphere, which is part of the cloud stack. Again, doesn't really matter if it's a standalone external one. It will list all the instances. However, the recommendation is that uh, the instance is, in a, instance is in a stop state, which indeed it is, as you can see over here. So that's the one I want to migrate. So I'm going to obviously choose this one and hit the import instance button. Uh, same story, which hopefully I don't need to repeat, but the interesting part is you can always import this instance for another account, another human user, another company, another tenant, or to another project. These APIs can only be executed by the cloud administrator, which hopefully makes sense. So without uh, basically now um, repeating myself, uh, that's something you already know from last 10 minutes. And we can optionally choose which KVM host will do the conversion. This is where you can actually choose your real nine from another cluster, even though you have another 100 hosts on, based on Ubuntu. And optionally, you can choose the uh, temporary storage location for the QCOW file during the business. Here, we, you have a profile of the VM, so it kind of just helps you, let's confirm, you know, it's one CPU and half a gig of RAM. Uh, so it basically helps you just choose the proper size, but you can choose basically whatever you want, really. Uh, finally, let's attach to a proper network. Um, and here we updated the UI. It's a little bit inconsistent. The force button here was changed to allow duplicate MAC addresses, which is still kind of confusing, but there is a pop-up which says that if the MAC address is part of the CloudStack database, which this one really is, because this is a CloudStack-based VM, it will regenerate or give you a random new MAC address. Hitting OK, this will take a lot of minutes. Uh, and obviously I'm not going to wait or I didn't bother to cut the video. I'm just instead showing you the VM which I previously uh, imported. That's pretty much it. It's a stopped VM. Uh, you may want, uh, you can confirm the hardware profile, you can confirm that it's connected to a proper network which you've chosen, you can change the operating system time, obviously here I've already chosen, but by default, as I said, it's CentOS 4, 5, 32 bits, so make sure just to do this extra step to choose the correct operating system type. And that's pretty much it, and after that you're ready to boot the instance. And that's pretty much all. Now this process takes quite a long time, uh, because it copies, it boots the temporary VM, uh, in, um, uh, creates, but at the moment, it creates a local QCOW2 QCO2 files on the destination, EL9, for example, based Kevin host. It sets, it, it uses an NBD driver to set the backing file of those empty QCOW2 over HTTPS protocol, all the way to the vCenter, all the way to the VMDKs. So effectively boot the VM from QCOW2, but all the rights and modifications are sent to the VMDK. That's how it's implemented in this release. We have improvements in the next one. It modifies the VM, boots the VM, a temporary VM, temporary VM, body, um, modifies its inject virtual drivers if necessary. Sometimes it's aware, all right, this one has the virtual drivers, I'm skipping doing that. For Windows, as I said, it will even modify the Windows registry. It closes the temporary VM and then it converts this to a final QCOW2 file and starts basically a VM. If you want more details on how this works, obviously you can read something online. There are presentations from my colleagues Nicholas and also Suresh uh, on this feature, uh, very detailed with nice diagrams and everything else, so you can actually more visualize what I'm just speaking about now. Now, a couple of coming improvements in the next uh, minor re release. You can see I basically underlined the number one. This, is, this was 4.19.0, but the coming release is 4.19.1, hopefully mid or end of July. Uh, we've seen improvement, pr pr performance improvements from four up to 10 times in certain uh, cases, which means up to 10 times shorter duration to migrate a VM. 
because we approach using V2V in a different way. This tool can connect and convert things in a, a lot of different ways. Uh, also, we have a new feature, uh, which is importing data volumes uh, from existing QCOW2 file. Just like we create instance from already existing QCOW2 file, now you also place QCOW2 file, but you say to CloudStack, I want this to be a data disk, period. Previously, you had to upload this to a, UR, to a web server, download as a volume into CloudStack, which is on the secondary storage, attach it. It's moved automatically to the primary storage. It was a whole hassle. Now you just place the bloody QCOW2 file on the... Uh, NFS, and you are good to go. Uh, also, uh, one of my colleague who was developing this feature was bored probably between the certain things, and he added on one other feature which was not originally scoped, which is excellent, which is unmanaging existing data volumes from CloudStack, basically marking the volume as deleted in CloudStack, but don't really delete it, and then uh, the customer can do it themselves. Uh, and we also have the option to... Uh, talk. I don't know what happened. We also have the option to actually, uh, well, this importing is managing. Uh, again, one of my colleagues who is sitting in this room way was again bored, and then instead of only supporting NFS, he also made sure that it works for Ceph as well. So you can actually import Ceph or re revert database, create a reverse database records, and then it will appear as an existing volume, data volume in CloudStack, which is excellent. Um, that's pretty much it for some of the coming improvements when it comes to the migrations and uh, completely unrelated. Yet another colleague from the community is working on optimizing uh, optimizing uh, CloudStack to be able to handle in a performant way to handle up to 50,000 hypervisors, 50,000 physical hosts, and I think the, the scope for one of the Bigger, bigger or biggest or will be the biggest, uh, I guess, uh, users of CloudStack eventually. Uh, by, I think around 2 million VMs. I'm not sure if it's 1 or 2 million VMs, but it was some insane number. So we're now going very deep into analysis, or actually my colleagues are going very deep into analysis of MySQL or wherever, wherever you can you know, find some tweaks to actually ensure that the list VM API doesn't take like you know 10 seconds or 4 minutes when you have 2 million VMs. Right, it has to be quick, so to make it basically a pretty responsive in that sense. Uh, that's pretty much it, completely unrelated. But I was myself kind of very interested in this feature or, or this kind of improvements. So just as uh, interesting news, uh, we have a CloudStack collaboration conference coming in uh, well 2024, which is this year, I guess, uh, in Madrid, Spain, on the given dates. So uh, feel free to either take a pictures or participate in, in the at least user at mailing list, where where is where we kind of announce the call for papers. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, getting in touch, obviously, you are probably aware of all of this. And again, the mailing list being the best uh, way or the best place to actually get help. Uh, that's from all from my side. Now we have a couple of minutes for questions, if anybody has anything. <laughs>